Looking Change is a lot of people refer to it as the Proverbs of the New Testament. It deals a lot with wisdom. And uh, so that'll be kind of what we'll look at a little bit tonight. It'll be about wisdom, walking in wisdom, living in wisdom. Amen? And uh, God does promise to give us wisdom, yes. liberally, if we ask. So we have no reason not to be wise and not to make wise choices. Amen? Amen. So we can never use the excuse again that we didn't understand, we didn't know. Amen? Yeah. Okay, so we got that covered. James chapter 1. I'm going to begin at verse 1 for just a moment. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now, one of the things, whenever I, I look at a book, and, and I always enjoy how they're introduced. And I enjoy sometimes how, how, you know, James, a servant of God. That word there, servant, is actually bond servant. A bond servant is somebody who made a choice to be a servant. Uh, somebody who may be in a situation who had to serve somebody to pay a debt or what have you. And they were a servant for a period of time. And after they were released, they said, no, I choose to stay here and I choose to serve you. So it's somebody who was a servant who had made a choice to be a servant out of love, so to speak. And James, they were saying that he is a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He is the Lord's bond servant. And we find that Paul mentions himself and refers to himself that way. And Romans, I know, and Philippians, and Titus, I think. And, and Peter also refers to himself that way. So I find it interesting. It's not like so often that, you know, modern people might have this great resume and, you know, might say James, uh, apostle of Jesus Christ, and list off five different degrees they have and all the different stuff they've done. But very simply refers to himself as a servant or as a bond servant. We know that Jesus Christ was the perfect example or the perfect model of a servant. And we see that illustrated quite often and used to it and referred to it in uh, talking about when Jesus at the Last Supper talked about that last week, I believe. And he, he took the place of a servant and washed their feet and, and cleansed their feet and told them that if he was, could do that, that they should likewise do that also. So he's the model and example of being a servant. He was the perfect servant of God. Uh, you know, and it's just, that's an odd concept in the time we live, I think, because so much of what we think in our culture, our society, everything's always about bigger and better, more important, more applause, and, you know, more hub hub. And everybody's always looking for the bigger and better church, or there's a lot of pastors that, you know, or in ministry, like it's a corporate thing, looking, climbing the ladder to get the bigger, better church, or, or maybe people in the congregation always looking for the bigger, better church, or what have you. But here James comes across, across very simply, very plainly, says, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. I am a servant. But yet we understand the Bible teaches us that if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then you have to be the greatest servant. So that's exactly the opposite of how we look at it in our time and in our society. The Word of God says the greatest is the greatest servant. So if we want to be the greatest one in the church, and we want all the applause and accept the kingdom of God, then we should be the greatest servant in the church. If we want to be the, the one in, in the body of Christ that gets all the, uh, all the accolades of the kingdom of God, then we have to be the greatest servant in the church. It's not necessarily the one who has the, the highest status or the most degrees or the greatest applause in this world, but it's in the kingdom of God is the one who is the greatest servant. And, and that makes perfectly good sense because if I was to ask anybody here say, in the Bible, who was the greatest servant that there ever was? I'm sure everybody would say Jesus, wouldn't you? I mean, that would be nice to say, well, Jesus was the greatest servant. Well, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? Wouldn't you say Jesus? I mean, out of everybody in the Bible, isn't Jesus the greatest? He loved all names. By becoming that servant, he became exalted to that place, a name above all names. And so we understand that in the kingdom of God, quite often, things are just the opposite of what they are in the kingdom of the world. In the kingdom of the world, it's all about self-promotion and putting ourselves out there. In the kingdom of God, it's all about being a servant for Jesus Christ. It's all about being that bond servant. So that's just by way of introduction. If you want to drop down to verse 2, we're just going to say, go to look at a few highlight verses here tonight. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, that scripture right there normally will get people nervous. Count it all joy when you enter into diverse temptations or different trials. 
or different battles or different struggles. So the first thing the Word exhorts us to do here is to count in joy because we're in a battle. To count in joy because we're in a, trouble, in, in, in a struggle. Now most of the time when we enter into a, 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 an intense battle, we don't necessarily count in joy, do we? I mean, that's not normally how we respond to a battle. That's not normally how we respond to a struggle. That's not normally when people come and say, Pastor, I'm just really under attack by the enemy, but praise God, I count it as joy. That's usually not what I hear come out of people's mouths. That's usually not how we express it. But we have to really look at this and understand what this is saying. And we're going to enter into tonight a little bit of a study about that trial, about that test, about that battle, and understand what it's talking about here. I mean, you know, we just... First, first Peter, go there real quick. I'm going to bounce you around a little bit. I'm trying to I'm about to get ahead of myself. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. First of all, we're going to look at some things about that battle, about that struggle, about that trial. First Peter chapter 4, verse number 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. So one of the first things it tells us here that we look at is when that trial comes and when that battle comes, don't think it's some strange thing that it's happened to you. But quite often, usually that's exactly what people think. That's exactly how people respond. I mean, one of the first things you hear from people when they're in a battle is, oh, Pastor, what did I do to deserve this? Why me? You hear that all the time. Why me? What did I do to deserve this? Why would this happen to me? Where's God at? Well, why do they think it's strange that they're in a battle? I mean, can you imagine somebody calling you up and, and, and we are in room where we are in war, but can you imagine somebody you know gets deployed in the military and they're off in a, in a battle zone and they call you up and say, I don't understand this way. It's a crazy thing ever. I don't understand why me. They're shooting at me. <laughs> why me? Why would they shoot at me? Well, that doesn't make sense, does it? But that's what Christians do. Why me? Why am I in this battle? Well, guess what? You have an enemy. His name is Satan. And he's out to destroy you. And yet you think it's strange and you're trying to figure out why in the world are people shooting at me? Why are these attacks coming against me? Why are these things happening to me? Why would you think it's strange? We live in a cursed world. Satan is our enemy in, in, in running this place. We are in enemy territory. We're wondering every once in a while why people are shooting at us. This is warfare. The enemy is going to take his shots. And he's going to attack. You see, anytime we enter into these sufferings and any time we enter into these battles, we've got to understand something. What does the Word of God say in Psalm 34? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivereth from them all. So we need to understand, yes, there's going to be battles. Yes, there's going to be afflictions. Yes, there's going to be attacks. Yes, there's going to be struggles. Yes, there's going to be many afflictions, so to speak. But we have to understand we have a promise from the Lord to deliver us from them all. So we better understand how to be delivered from them all. Because, beloved, I'll be honest with you, I see a lot of people who, who got the many afflictions part down. But the second part of that verse they're struggling with. And that's being delivered from them all. I mean, we've got, you know, you know, most people have got many afflictions now. Do you have many afflictions? Well, he's got there everywhere. Are you being delivered from them? Well, the Word of God says we should be. Yes, sir. So many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. You see, the Bible tells us how we prepare for those things. You've heard me talk quite often about the, the two houses, haven't you? The, the parable that Jesus taught. He tells us how to be prepared and how to be ready for those afflictions. He tells us how to be battle ready. And those who hear the word and do it are the house that's built upon the rock, aren't they? And when the storms come or the attacks come, they stand. Those who hear the word of God and don't do it are when the storms come and the afflictions come, they're the house built on sand and they fall. So one of the first 
things we have to ask ourselves. Beloved, would you agree with me that the Bible's true and there are many afflictions? Would you agree with me that the Bible's true and there are fiery trials? Would you agree with me that you're not special and that includes you? And that includes me? So then we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared? Is our house built upon the rock? Because we already know that the battles come. We already know the afflictions come. We already know the trials come. But the question is, are we prepared and battle ready? Is our house built upon rock? Is our house built upon the Word of God? Are we hearing the Word of God and applying it to our lives and put it into practice? Because if we are, then we'll stand strong. If we're not, we won't. Amen? Amen. So we know how a wise man stands. But one of the things here... Go to Hebrews chapter 2. And we're just laying some groundwork into where we're going to get into. Hebrews chapter 2, <coughs> verse 18. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Let me read two verses real quick. For that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them, secure them that are tempted. He is able, he is able, he is able to aid those who are tempted. He is able to help those who are tempted. Why? Because that he himself has suffered and he himself has been in the trials. Okay, now go to Hebrews chapter 4. Should be just a page over. We were there this morning. The same Jesus, remember? The same Jesus that walked the earth. The same Jesus that died on the cross. The same Jesus that's buried. The same Jesus that's resurrected. The same Jesus was ascended. And the same Jesus is our high priest in heaven right now. That was moved with compassion. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But was it all points tempted or tried or tested, like as we are, yet without sin? You see, one of the first things when we're going through a battle, and we're going through a struggle, and we're going through a trial, and we want to start, if we, if we want to put it bluntly, feeling sorry for ourselves, one of the first things that will start coming out of our mouth at that time is you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand my trial. You don't understand my battle. Pastor, you don't understand what it feels like. I have a, a, a bad answer for that every time somebody tells me that. I don't understand. But Jesus does. You don't understand my trials. You don't understand my battles. Even if you've been through the same thing, you don't understand them. You don't understand what I'm going through in the midst of a battle, do you? I don't understand. We, we, I don't pretend to understand what people are going through. But I do know this, Jesus does. Jesus does understand. He does understand your trials. Amen. He does understand your tests. He does understand your battle. And he's the one who can help you in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the trial, and in the midst of the struggle. So we have it all joy. Now here's what we've got to look at. Before we get any farther, go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Let us clarify some stuff. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13. Here's some more rejoicing in the midst of the battle. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13. But rejoice! What am I rejoicing in? In so much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. So rejoice that you're going to Christ's sufferings. Now we're going to take a little bit of a fine tooth comb tonight and we're going to understand what that's talking about. Because quite honestly, beloved, I hear a lot of people say, well, praise God, I'm just rejoicing because I'm suffering with Jesus. <laughs> now, a lot of times, most of the battles people are going through, most of the suffering I see people going through has nothing to do with Jesus. There is talking about rejoice. Let's look at this real quickly again. Let me read it again. But rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Not your sufferings. Of Christ's sufferings. Not your sufferings. It's easy in the midst of a battle, in the midst of a struggle, to say that 
we are suffering for Jesus. But most of the time when people tell me they're suffering for Jesus, they're not. See, there's different ways we could go through battles. There's different ways we could go through struggles. There's different ways we could go through battles. But it's very specific what it is to be able to go through sufferings with Jesus. Let me explain something to you. Probably, go to Galatians chapter 6. Yeah, I know you know this scripture, but let me read it to you. Make sure so you know I'm not making it up. We're going to dissect suffering or dissect problems or dissect battles a little bit and get an understanding of that. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. <coughs> I personally think this covers a lot of what we refer to as, as our battles of our afflictions in life. Be not deceived, God shall not be mocked. As a man soweth, thus shall he reap it. Be not deceived, God shall not be mocked. As a man soweth, thus shall he reap it. If we make a bad decision and suffer the consequences for that bad decision, we are not suffering with Christ. Jesus did not suffer any time at any point in his life because he made bad decisions. Correct? So probably 99% of the battles we go through are eliminated from being the sufferings of Christ. I mean, we, we, we just, you know, that, that's a big part of it right there. You know, and you can sit and you look at people's lives, and, and I can remember the years at Faith, Hope, and Love when I would sit and listen to people's situations and circumstances and, and counsel them all day long, every day. You know what? I got it down to right. I used to tell people, I say, just make a simple connection. It's just simple. You put a crack pipe to your mouth, you go to jail. Just figure that one out. It's that simple. You know, you go down to the tavern and you start drinking, you go to jail. Make the connection. And there's very simple things sometimes with people. And that sounds silly and that sounds funny, but, but beloved, that's what addiction is. Addiction is, is believing the oldest lie that was ever given. That old lie was when Satan told, told Eve, said, oh, you can eat the tree and not die. The oldest lie is that you can sin and not suffer consequences. The oldest lie is that, hey, I can do this and not suffer consequences. Beloved, that's a lot of our suffering right there. I mean, we are in a society that, and, and I don't mean to pound on food sometimes, that's eating itself to death. I mean, Rachel takes care of people all the time, every day, that most of them are there because they're reaping what they sow, to be honest. Many of them are there, not a lot of them, but a lot of them are there because of decisions they've made in life to not take care of themselves physically. They're not suffering for Jesus. They're suffering as a consequence of decisions that they've made. So we don't count in joy about that. I'm not going to rejoice in my bad decisions. I'm not going to do out here and do something really dumb and then suffer the consequences a month later and, oh, rejoice in the Lord, I'm just going through this affliction. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get before God and repent for making a dumb decision. You see, we have to understand what this affliction is so we know how to deal with it. And one of the things we have to do when we're reaping what we sow is we have to repent of that, get before God, and, and pray that its consequences will stop. But that's a lot of it, beloved, is we make decisions in the first place that didn't line up with God's word. So we're not the house on the rock. We're the house on the sand. I have some pastor, you ain't going to believe this, how people do this. There are people that I, that I will sit and give them pastoral counsel and give them the word, and they'll look in the eye and say, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. You know what? The consequences are down the road. And, and I usually tell them, you know what? You're going. I mean, when you make that kind of decision and, and you, you're telling the Lord, say, Lord, I, I don't want you to have anything to do with this. I'm on my own here. I'm not going to do your word, Lord. I, I'm not going to take your advice, Lord. I'm going to do this my way because in this instance, in this one time, Lord, I don't think your word's right. I think I am. And then suffer the consequences of that and blame the devil. Done that, haven't we? At some point in life, we probably 
every one of us has done that. Something we knew was wrong, we knew what the Word said, but for some reason something come over us, and we, were, we just came into it, and we did what we knew the Word would not have us to do. And we thought for some reason that we were special, and we weren't going to suffer the consequences of it. Because the devil was whispering in our ear, just like he was Eve, you shall not surely die. You won't suffer the consequences of that. God understands. Yeah, he does. He understands we're making a bad decision. We're going to suffer the consequences. So that's not what he's talking about. It's, it's not talking about that. Go to Mark chapter 4. And this one here is a little bit picky. Mark chapter 4. So there's a lot of our suffering is a result of planting the wrong seeds. Amen? Somebody says, well, I'm not going to tithe. Well, you, you planted the wrong seed. And you'll suffer the consequences. It's not big on tithing. I, I'm not going to spend any time in prayer. No, that's a wrong decision. You'll suffer the consequences. I'm not going to be in the Word. Well, that's the wrong decision. You'll suffer the consequences. Yeah. There, there are many different ways that we, we live our life, and, and you know we all fight these battles every day. Our flesh fights against doing the right thing every day. Amen? Yes. I mean, don't you battle your flesh every day? You know, we all do, don't we? You know what the real joys of pastoring is? I get to battle all your flesh. <laughs> Plus mine. I got to deal with mine, and I got to come through and deal with everybody else's. That's true. Mark chapter 4, verse 17 through 19. And notice this. Here's another area of a battle we do in life. And have no room in themselves, so endure. But for a time afterward, and when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering, choke the word, and becometh unfruitful. So we see there that, that, that there's, in verse 17, why are those things coming? For the word's sake. Verse 19, what's it trying to do? Choke the word. So there's a tax that will come on our life as a result of the word of God being planted into our hearts. There's a tax that will come against our life as a result of us living our life according to God's word. So there's the battles and afflictions there that are going to take place because of the word. Because we've heard the word, and because we've read the word, because we've studied the word, the enemy is going to come against us to try to stop that word from bearing fruit in our lives. Because we've made a decision in our life, I'm going to stand on the word, I'm going to believe the word, I'm going to walk in the word, a task will come upon our life. That's what that says. And we need to understand, and that's why there are certain things, you'll hear me, that I pound away on a lot. We need to understand what's taking place in our life when that's going on. That, you know, a lot of times people say, well, that's just happening to, to just teach you something. No, it ain't trying to teach you nothing. The word's trying to teach you something. The enemy's trying to stop it from teaching you something. Now, we look at those things and, well, they're just going through that suffering until they'll grow up in the Lord. No, suffering doesn't make you grow up in the Lord. Suffering doesn't make you holy. Suffering doesn't make you godly. Much of the battle in life is a result of the enemies attacking the Word. You see, we've got to understand that because in the time when we're getting in battle, because it's a reap what we sow, we need to repent. But if it's the enemy attacking the Word, we need to exercise authority. You know, but you got to understand the difference between the two because you can't exercise authority on what you're doing, what you're reaping, what you're sowing. Because you can use authority all day long on your own flesh and it ain't going to work. But you can't use authority on the enemy when he's attacked. Amen. See, it's very important that we're able to discern what's going on in our life and what's taking place in our life. But one of the things that you hear Christians do all the time, and it personally just gets under my skin a little bit, is give credit to the battle or the suffering for doing something in you for God. God's Word and God's Spirit shapes and molds you into a Christian character. Amen? Not suffering, otherwise everybody in jail will be holy. Everybody in the hospital will be sanctified. Everybody who's in some prison in the 
Dungeons of China would be really holy. It's not suffering against the word. The battle, the persecutions of the text is coming against the word. To stop the word, to quench the word. So we need to understand where the source of these things are. Amen? Amen. There's a time, go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Here's another area of attack. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, that's an attack, isn't it? They commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Acts chapter 5, verse 40 and 41. So in that particular instance, what has taken place there, we, we've seen that stretch. There were in Acts chapter 3 where they, Peter and John went in and they, and they were going to the hour of prayer and they commanded the man to rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. And after they commanded him to rise up and walk in the name of Jesus, they, they preached a sermon. Multitudes got saved and the, and the religious powers that be attacked them and, and tried to intimidate them and stop them from preaching in the name of Jesus. So that was an enemy's attack against the word of God, wasn't it? The word of God was going forth. The word of God was moving forth. The power of God was moving. And their sin miracles happened. And people come to Christ. And immediately then there was an attack on them to stop preaching or teaching in the name of Jesus. They were suffering with Jesus. The people with the reap what you sow stuff not suffering with Jesus. The, the, the word of God being planted in our heart. Not, I mean you can call that suffering with Jesus to a degree. But that's mainly the two kingdoms of battle. These people here, they're suffering with Jesus. You see, we've got to be very particular here. We don't rejoice because we've done something dumb and we're suffering the consequences of it. We don't necessarily rejoice because the enemy's attacking the word in our heart. I mean, it's good we got the word there, and it's good to understand what's taking place. We're going to take authority over that. But here, they're going forth. They're doing what God's told them to do. They're preaching in the name of Jesus. They're representing to Jesus to the world. And then attacks come against them. And, and this is something that I see a lot of Christians get confused with. You know, because I've known a lot of Christians who go to work and be really obnoxious, and their co-workers didn't like them, and so that's just because I'm a Christian. No, that's because you don't know how to represent Jesus very well. There is a difference. There is a difference. Amen? Stay with me so far. Let's go back to James chapter 1. I haven't forgotten. Just let it turn out. Because these are things that it's important for us to understand. And I don't know why I've been on this kick here lately so much, but James chapter 1. Verse number 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried. For when he is tried. For when he is tested. For when he is put on trial. Let me read that word tried there. It means to test, to scrutinize. It's like metals in dealing with impurities. Examine. Now we've got to understand something here. It's talking about those who endure the trial or endure the test. Now there's a couple of examples that we can look at in the Bible that are very clear with this. And one of the questions we were talking about was Job. Now, Job, I think, did some things that opened the door to allow the enemy to come into his life and allow the things that happened to him to happen. But one thing about Job that he did do is he then still stood strong. I mean, he didn't forsake God. He didn't abandon God. His wife tried to convince him to curse God and die. 
But he stood to the best of his knowledge at that point in time with God. And as an end result of that trial and that battle that he went through, as an end result of that, he received double of what he lost. But God blessed him in the end. Now keep in mind, everybody thinks of Job, everybody thinks of the sufferings. The sufferings that Job went through lasted just a few months in the span of his entire life. So we're talking about a few bad months that the man had. And I believe it was his fear that opened the door and allowed the enemy in. Because he, one of the things he said is, for that which I greatly feared has come upon me. You see, it would be a violation of Scripture for God to just say, okay, just go ahead and hammer him good. Because the Bible tells us that no curse can come without cause. So there has to be an open door for something like that to happen. God wouldn't sit there, you know what, I think I'll just slap you around with it. Wait, 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 just see if he still loves me. That's not what was taking place. But Job did endure patiently the trial and the test and the battle, and he never forsook God. And we see that as, as a result of that, he received back double fold that he had. Another couple of cases is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's many, but these are just a couple that come to mind. As Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we know that they went through the fiery furnace, didn't they? Mm-hmm. And they, they, that was, wouldn't you count that as a trial? Yeah. Wouldn't you count that as a battle? I mean, they were just, you know, cast into that furnace, and they were, you know, they, the Nebuchadnezzar they was built a golden idol, and they had to fall down and worship it, and when they played the music, and they refused to do that, and crank the furnace up, and, ca- and you know, cast them in there, and look, and there's a, well, there's one like the Son of Man, and they came out, and they hadn't been burnt, they didn't even smell like smoke, because they stood strong, they endured that trial, they came out okay, didn't they? We can say the same thing with Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6, when, when uh, people plotted against him, and and had the king make a decree that anybody who, who, who prayed to anybody but that king for a period of time would have to be cast into the lion's den. And they knew they could get Daniel with them because Daniel, they knew, openly prayed three times a day. And once they did that, Daniel continued to be faithful to God. Daniel continued to pray. Daniel was cast into the lion's den. God sent an angel down there and held the lion's mouth shut so he, they couldn't do anything. And Daniel was fine because he stood strong. So they were, that, that would be counting as a trial, wouldn't it? That would be counting as a battle. And as a result of them standing strong in the trial, they came out good on the other end of that trial. And that's the thing we've got to understand. We can't count it strange that a battle comes. We can't count it strange that a trial comes. If we're putting the word of God into our heart, we know the enemy is going to attack that, don't we? If we're representing Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, we know the enemy is going to attack that. And what we have to do is stand strong in those situations because what did the Bible say? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. So if we stand in faith and don't waver, we're going to come out on top of that trial. But if we don't stand in faith, we're not going to come out on top. If we're not building our life on the solid rock of those who hear the word and put it into practice, then this, those kind of storms are going to take us down. But it's important when he is tried, when he is tried. Now look back at verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now here's where people get all kind of goofed up. The trying of your faith worketh patience. They seem to think for some reason that the battle gives them faith. The battle, it doesn't say that, does it? Does it say that the trying, the battle is going to give you faith? It says the trying of your faith is going to work with patience. The trying, the battles never produce faith. Struggles never produce faith. Battles never produce faith. Where's faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes from the word of God, not from the battle. Not from the struggle. Not from the trial. People say out there, they come through a battle, they come to 
difference, isn't there? I mean, like I say, if you think about it, if battles and struggles built faith, again, put everybody in a hospital, they're going to cancer floors, they would be so strong in faith. But that ain't what happens, is it? People in the prisons, well, well they'd be faith giants. I mean, honestly, if we went around the room and, 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 and all the battles and all the struggles we went through, if those struggles built our faith, we would be just giants of faith, wouldn't we? I went through a lot of battles and struggles, and I can't make they did fill my faith. <laughs> what filled my faith is the Word of God. You see, my faith is a shield that I use in the battle to stop the battle. The shield of faith quenches all the fiery darts of the enemy. It's, the, it's there to stop the battle, not to have the battle build faith. For people have, have, have for, for generations in the body of Christ have that idea that, oh, well, they're just going through that trial to build their faith. That's goofy. Now, it will build your patience. If you stand in faith and don't waver, it will build your patience. Now, what do you mean by patience? Yeah, now, let me define this biblically. Uh, because I, I used to read patience, and here's what I always thought patience was in my mind when I read that word in the Bible. I thought patience meant I could wait for somebody and not get frustrated. The <laughs> Lord, I'm in trouble. Uh, I don't wait well at all. I don't wait. That's not what patience is in the Bible. You might say, well, that's very unique. Well, patience. That's not what patience is. The best definition I can give you biblically of patience is you stay the same. I'm waiting. The trial of your faith can work in patience or develop patience. In other words, your faith has been built up and kept strong in the Word of God. You have your shield of faith, and you've seen that weapon work. And once that weapon works in this battle, the next battle you come up, you, you're going to understand, I've got patience. I'm going to stay the same because I know that faith worked last time. It's going to work this time. And you come against a greater battle a little bit later, and you've got patience. You, I ain't going to waver. I ain't going to worry about it because I know that I can hold out my shield of faith, and I know that I that this faith is going to keep me strong and I know I'm going to see victory because I know the word of God is true. That's what patience is. It's enabling you to stay the same because your faith has been tried and tested and proven and stood strong. Then you have patience. You know, one of the things that for years that, that I struggled with tremendously in my faith life was finances. I mean, it didn't take hardly anything to just get my boat rocking. And I went through a few battles, and I went through a few trials, and I went through a few tests, and I stood on the Word of God, and, you know, that's just an area that I don't waver hardly at all anymore. And I'm not saying there aren't times when it gets my attention, but that's about what it is. It gets my attention. And it may get my attention the way I think, well, maybe I need to change this or that. But as far as something to where my faith is going to waver, my faith is going to waver in that area. I understand something. Everything I do in life financially comes out my faith. It has to. Amen. It has to. Because the devourer has been rebuked. And God has promised to pour out his blessings. And he's promised to open up the windows of heaven. I walk financially under open heaven. It has to work out in my favor. I may not see how it's going to happen. I may not understand how it's going to happen. I may not be able to reason how it's going to happen. But I know that it has to work in my favor. Because my money's blessed. Somebody else's money may be cursed, but my money's blessed. Because the Word of God says so. And so I have patience in that area. I don't, I'm not going to be wavering and rocking. Oh, God, what's going to happen here? I'm going to start today. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I know. You see, patience is what gets you from prayer to manifestation without wavering. Because you stay the same. I mean, I, you know, they, for example, you see us all the time, people come up, and, and, and I'm not knocking, but I'm just, this is our, what we do as humans. We've all done this, don't tell me you have it. You come and you, you get prayed for, and you feel just a touch of God, woo, glory to God, woo, I got the victory. And by the time you pull it out of the parking lot, you've totally gone on down, and you don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> people do that, don't they? Yeah. People do that. Say, well, they ain't like faith. They lack like patience. Patience is staying the same. Patience means what you believe at the altar, you believe three days later. You believe five days later. You believe a week later. You believe a month later. What you have grabbed a hold of and believed out of the Word of God, patience keeps that the same. 
wage here in chapter 1 says, the man who wavers receives nothing. You see, the Bible tells us through faith and patience we inherit the promises. Faith believes it. Patience stays the same. So, what you believe in God for today, if you have patience, just, and it's, it's a minute before it's manifested, a month from now you haven't seen it manifest, you're still the same. You haven't changed. You're still rejoicing. You're still praising Him. You're still counting and dust. Patience stays the same. <coughs> you see, you ever think about Noah? I mean, Noah went from the time that God spoke to him about the rain, all those years building that boat, it took patience to build that boat. You think there was a time that Noah got up in the morning and didn't want to go to work build a boat? <laughs> I mean, that took a lot, didn't it? <clears throat> You look at Abraham and Sarah from the time they received the promise. There was a period of time before they received Isaac. Do you think there was a, didn't need patience, unwavering, to get from point A to point B? You see, that's what's so important, beloved, for us to understand. Now, battle-tested faith is going to give you some patience. Remember when, when David went up against Goliath? What did he do? He thought back to the past victories, didn't he? Wait a second. I know that Goliath is a big, ugly dude, but, but the same God who delivered me from the bear and the same God who delivered me from the lion is going to deliver me from Goliath. Why? Those battles had developed faith. They didn't, I mean, had developed patience. They didn't develop faith. He wasn't going to waver. His faith was tested and tried and proven. The trial of the faith had produced patience to where he understood how I had to stand. All I gotta do is stand. All I gotta do is stand. You see, that was the thing that we've got to understand. Through faith and patience. Hebrews chapter 6, let me show you that. It'd be a good verse for us all of you to hold it up. Hebrews chapter 6. Hallelujah. Verse 12. That you be not slothful. Don't be lazy. But powers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we are to follow those who through unwavering faith have inherited the promises of God. Now let me show you something in James chapter 1. One last point. I'm not done here. Go back to James chapter 1. Because we hear this verse all the time, but I want to apply it specifically 
to what we're doing tonight. Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. They give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You know what? When you're in that trial, and you're in that battle, and you're, you're up against it, what are you supposed to do? Ask God for wisdom. Because that wisdom right there is, is specifically talking about in that battle, in that trial. When you're walking out something by faith, when we're walking out something by faith, and we feel like we're up against it, God is saying, just ask me wisdom what you need to do. Ask me many of the afflictions to the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all, saying, Lord, okay, we got the afflictions part down. But what do I need to do to see this deliverance manifest? Give me wisdom, God. Give me wisdom on what I need to do to see this victory manifest. What do I need to do to see this deliverance manifest? God, I'm standing on your word. I'm standing in faith. Why am I not seeing this take place? God says, just ask me. And I will give you that wisdom liberally. He doesn't say just, just endure the battle. Just endure the trial. God's working something out in you. He doesn't say that. Because see, God's, God, God's goal in the midst of that is to deliver us from it. Because that's what his word is promised. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord deliver us from them all. So God's will is to be delivered from them all. But a lot of times we need God's wisdom to see that manifest in our life. And that's what we need, God. What do I need to do, God? I, I know what your word says, Lord. I know what your promise says. But I'm not seeing it manifest in my life. I'm standing here in faith, Lord. What do I need to do? What wisdom can you give me to see this take place? See, that scripture comes very meaningful in that sense when we look at it in the context of what it's teaching us. And that's one of the things that I, I learned to do. I want to practice more as God. I know what your word promises, God. What do I need to do? What do I need to do for it? What step of faith do I need to take? What step of faith am I missing here? Why is it not being manifest? But God will give us wisdom in those situations. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 God's purpose is for us to walk in victory. Through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. So be checking your life out a little bit. If you got a bunch of frequent you sow problems, get before God, say, Lord, I'm going here and I made some bad choices, I made some bad decisions, but Lord, I, I just need to repent of that, I need to put it under the blood, and I need to move on. If there's some battles in your life and you're not seeing the victory, say, God, I need some wisdom. I need you to show me, Lord, what I need to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's have to use the keyword.